Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the 2021 Fine Arts Festival. Uh, this video is the fourth of five total sessions happening online this summer, hosted by different alums from our department who are talking about their areas of expertise. We have a lot of great sessions this summer, so be sure to check out our full schedule online at gordon.edu slash fineartsfest. Uh, we hope to provide you with some great opportunities to connect with each other, learn some new skills, and grow overall as artists. Today, I am joined by by Stephen Schultz. Uh, Stephen graduated from Gordon College in 2017 with a BA in Communication Arts and works as a New England wedding and portrait photographer and small business owner. As a kid, he often observed his mother document their family's memories with a camcorder. Something about that hit home with him, so he bought his first camera in eighth grade just to give it a try. Eight years later and countless photos later, he still uses a camera to preserve memories and tell stories, except now he does it for a living. Stephen also recently started a podcast called Rally Caps, a podcast for creative entrepreneurs who are ready to double down and build a business for the long haul. And I will just say too, uh, another one of Stephen's claims to fame is that he is the former executive producer of Exit 17 Live, the late night show here at Gordon, um, mm -hmm. which is probably how we first met. I think it is. I would think. Yeah, it um, is. We overlapped for two years, I think, if you were 2017. I think so. 2018. Yeah. Or I was 2019. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I had completely forgotten about that until you <laughs> mentioned it just now. Yeah, that's true. Dude, what a great intro. Thank you oh, so thank much. You. That's uh, really fun. I've not been introed before. I'm, I'm glad I could cool. uh, uh, do it uh, <laughs> justice for you. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, we're going to be talking about all things photography today, entrepreneurship, yeah. mm -hmm. um, any anything else really that uh, yeah. you feel like talking about we can talk about. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if to get us started, if you wouldn't mind just sort of talking a little bit more about how you first got into photography, maybe yeah. middle school, high school into college, just sort of yeah. where you've been. Uh, Totally. Yeah. Let's get into it. All right. Yeah. So, so back in middle school and high school, as you mentioned in the intro, it was middle school for me when I mm. got my first camera. And I think like a lot of people, a lot of kids that age, the, the big thing for photography, it was, you know, early high school ish is when Instagram became a thing and when yeah. cameras in smartphones became a lot more normal. Right. So even though I had this little point and shoot that I got in middle school, it became more of a thing and a hobby for me when I just had this camera with me everywhere I went because yeah. it wasn't a thing that I had to plan for. Right. So I always had a camera, could just kind of experiment with different ideas just for kicks. Uh, and that was, that was really fun. I think just having access to it uh, was a big reason why it became as huge a part of my life as it is now. Mm -hmm. um, but even then, it was still on the back burner because in high school and even uh, kind of early into college, music was my primary way of just expressing myself and yeah. kind of like the artistic thing that I liked to do. So the, the fun crossover with that is the fact that in middle school and high school, you know, I, I played on like my church's worship team and at uh, led worship at my high school and um, played in like a punk like garage band as well and like played at bars on the weekends and all this stuff. So I knew what it was like to be on the stage. And then when I started to get into photography, the first thing that I wanted to do was photograph concerts because I knew that I had probably the most insight of any genre of photography because I had, I had done it, so I thought, well, I, I know what I wanted to see in the photos that some people would take of us, so I could probably do that for them and have that, that empathy and uh, just kind of enjoy that. So there's, like a, there's a period of time where those two hobbies like crossed over yeah, a good amount. Which is awesome. Yeah, it was really fun. It was like, and it was, the coolest thing is like I got to work with a ton of my friends because they were the connections that I had to yeah. like the local music industry in Albany, New York, which is where I grew up. Mm -hmm. And so it was a way to like still be in like my music community, but yeah. like get to work with them in a really fun way. And everyone Very was cool. really stoked about the photos and it was, it was a great way to ease into it. And then through that, I found that I just liked taking photos yeah. in general, not just concert photography. Definitely. Yeah. And so then do you want to talk a little bit about maybe sort of photography in college and sort yeah. of getting into wedding photography a little bit. And then maybe yeah. when you sort of started thinking, Oh, this could, like be a career path. Yeah. For me, sort of oh man. That all 
totally come about. yeah 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 so what a what a funny thing to reminisce about so Photography in college for me was really strictly a hobby, one that I really loved. But my entire time at Gordon in the comm department, just across the board, I was entirely focused on getting like a traditional salaried job yeah. post-grad because that's what every parent wants for their kid and that's right. what everyone is kind of you know, raised to just do, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very wise and stable thing to do, I should say, yeah. as well. Uh, yeah, no, it, it's, a, it's a very highly advised thing. Um, I'll get more into that once I explain how I ended up uh, getting into like, the career of photography. But um, in college itself, that was my mindset. I was like, this is really fun to do. I, I, was, I worked as a student photographer. I did a lot of editorial work for the school. I covered a lot of events on campus. Yeah. Uh, and I worked with Mark Spooner, who's the staff photographer mm -hmm. here, a very good friend of mine. And he was kind of the gateway into weddings themselves for me. Um, but beyond working as a photographer, e even getting into my senior year and taking the two photo classes at the time that Gordon offered with Bill Franson, again, a huge moment for me just as an artist because I got to work with a very accomplished lifelong photographer yeah. and appreciate, I think, the more abstract art of it as well. Because, you know, editorial photography, it, it can be artistic for sure, but it's, mm -hmm. it's a lot more like reacting to moments rather than trying to create an image and, and visualize right. it before you even take it. And I think that's what I learned with Bill. So by the end of my time as a student, I was at this point where I felt like I had really honed in my reactive photojournalist abilities through yeah. the, the job. And then I also developed more of an artistic eye with photography and, and learning how to use a camera and lighting and all this stuff to kind of craft a moment before it's even a photo, yeah. if you will. Um, and that's where Mark comes back in because by the time I graduated, I didn't have a job. I had actually gotten an offer, but I turned it down because... I knew going into it that it was a job very similar to an internship that I had in yep. college. I was like, you know what? I hated my life during that time <laughs> and I can't like knowingly go into that and yeah. be okay with that. Um, so I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to second shoot a couple of weddings. I'll, I'll shoot a couple of my own mm -hmm. for this summer. And then by the end of the summer, I'll have found a salaried job elsewhere, yeah. but I'm just going to use photography as a way to tide myself over yeah. for you know June to September at mm -hmm. the latest. And September rolled around. I had shot about I, th I think 14 or 15 weddings by then. Okay. Um, so it was a pretty busy summer. It wasn't. This is after your senior year. It is after my senior yeah. year. So this is yeah the summer of 2017, and I'm at that point where I had been sharing this work on Instagram, and suddenly you know, not suddenly, but after three months time, I was starting to get inquiries for weddings for the following year for mm -hmm. 2018. I was like, oh, okay, that's kind of cool. And then yeah. in September, I had the thought of, well, maybe instead of putting all this time into looking for a job elsewhere, maybe I'd take that time and I put it into learning how to build a business instead. Yeah. And that's what I did. I started to make a lot of mistakes, I should clarify. <laughs> um, but just like through that process of like being a very young, fresh out of college person mm -hmm. and having this passion that I didn't really know how to turn into a job, but I knew I wanted to do it for a living. Yeah, I just was very fortunate in that I got to learn from a lot of peers and people that have done it before me, people like Mark. Um, and then also have access to, I mean, the amount of education on YouTube, for example, right. is huge. There, there's so many resources available there. Um, and it was through all of that that I was able to kind of ramshackle this little business <laughs> together within the first year. And I had a, an increasingly successful second season as a wedding yeah. photographer. And it just kind of built momentum mm -hmm. as it went along. Nice. Yeah. What do you think are maybe some of the key, I don't know, factors that played into sort of creating your business or I guess what, what worked really well for you and what maybe didn't work hmm. so well when getting started. Yeah. Um, any advice that you would give yourself four years ago, either positive or negative? Like yeah. Definitely you got to do that or yeah, yeah, don't yeah. Do, do that. Um, I think the thing that jumps to mind is actually what I alluded to earlier uh -huh. in that it would have been a lot more comfortable for me to have a nine to five yeah. that I have a guaranteed paycheck from 
and then have that as my baseline to then build a little side hustle off of. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, for better or worse, you know, I'm, I'm here today doing it, but the beginning was definitely tough, you yeah. know, going from, from student to, okay, I'm just going to be self-employed right out of the gate right. is, um, is daunting <laughs> for sure. And in hindsight, I don't know <laughs> why I necessarily even <laughs> chose that to be honest, but you know, for whatever reason, I just felt compelled to just give it my all. And I think mm -hmm. in the back of my head, I was like, well, if there's ever a time to try something and fail, it's now because the stakes are really low. Right. Um, and, and I had the, the flexibility and the freedom to fail at this if I were to fail. Um, so, you know, I was kind of like a, a lot of people had a ton of roommates right out of college. My rent was really cheap. Um, my then girlfriend, now wife, Laura, she and I were not engaged yet. And we were in the process of trying to budget out, you know, a ring and, uh, you know, how to put a wedding together and like, where are we going to live and, right. and all this stuff. So, you know, there was a little bit more uh, of a freedom to just attempt it. Mm -hmm. And at, at least at the very least in hindsight, I could say, well, I, I gave it my best shot yeah. um, if it didn't pan out. Um, but I'm very grateful that it did <laughs> and it continues to. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I know the one question that we got uh, on Instagram is, uh, what do you think is the best way to promote yourself when you don't have really any budget to promote yourself? You know, when you don't have any paid, paid advertising, how do yeah. you sort of get those initial connections or that exposure um, when you're just starting out? That's a great question. Uh, I think one of the benefits of the, I'll, I'll say the wedding photography industry specifically, but I think this kind of applies to any creative arts industry, yeah. um, is that word of mouth is huge. Right. Um, and there's no greater referral than, especially for a wedding, for example, right. than, than like <laughs> one of your friends saying like, oh, this guy just shot my wedding. You've, you've got to check him out yeah. also. Um, that speaks volumes. And especially yeah. for a day as personal as a wedding, having a personal referral is, is very, very significant. Um, and it's been really fun over the years to, you know, photograph, maybe, maybe it's three siblings, all of them are sisters yeah. and I've been able to photograph all of their weddings. And then mm -hmm. over time, see the family over and over again. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, that's so cool that I've built this like long-term relationship yeah. with y'all because of weddings and getting to have access to such a special day Definitely. for the couple and for the families involved too. So, Getting back to the question, I think the that yeah, word of mouth referrals are so so powerful. I've actually I've never paid for advertising myself, um, whether on Facebook or Instagram or whatever other places even just do paid advertising. Like I've never gone that route because I've again I, I feel very fortunate in this, but I've just had a really great organic network grow over the years, uh, and I think frankly just there's a lot to be said about just like being a nice person and being good at what you do. Like that combination is really strong because if you come in and you're accommodating and, and you're kind to everybody yep. and you're, you're doing a great job at what you're supposed to be doing while also being aware of the people around you. Yeah. Um, weirdly enough, I feel like it, that's not the expectation that people have, especially mm -hmm. of like photographers on a wedding day. Um, I don't know why, but I think that really, I think that like, really is is it means a lot to them yeah. because if anything they're like oh well like this stranger this vendor is just gonna come in they're gonna do their thing mm -hmm. we're gonna get married and all that and when i come in i'm like let's be best friends <laughs> it's it's totally different yeah. to them i mean i'd uh, rather have someone with a good attitude at my wedding yeah. than just like someone who's <laughs> it's like moping around in the corner <laughs> right right yeah exactly so i think there's a lot to be said about yeah. about that just you know Work hard, be nice to people. Yeah. That's a really powerful combination. Awesome. Yeah. Nice. So uh, already you've talked a lot. Uh, we've talked a lot about sort of how photography doesn't necessarily fall into that typical nine to five um, mm -hmm. job category. What uh, would you say are some benefits of not working a regular nine to five? Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe also some cons of yeah. not working nine to five. What's sort of that, that balance? That's a phenomenal question. Um, yeah, this is something I've been thinking about a lot recently because um, we might talk about this a little more, but mm. my wife and I are moving to Chicago very soon. Mm. And in that process, we are uh, downsizing to a one bedroom apartment and I am then going to have a studio that I work out of with some friends. Nice. And 
having worked out of my home for the past four years, I was very, I was very ready to go for 2020. The work from home <laughs> thing was not uh, a problem for me. Um, one of the things that I've grown to love and hate a little bit is when you're working from home, obviously it's awesome. Yeah. Right. It's super fun. You're like, oh, I don't, I don't have to even put on pants if I don't want right. to. Right. Like I can just go sit at my desk. I've got, you know, the, the dress shirt on. I can show up for my Zoom calls or whatever it is. But it's it's really nice because it's so convenient and because you have access to it all the time. And I think the the common um, refrain that you'll hear from people is like, oh, well, like I set my own hours. I can work whenever I want. I don't have to start my commute at seven in the morning. I can sleep until 10 and then work until seven or like whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and I, I, you know, I've done that for seasons for sure. Mm -hmm. And now I'm kind of on the, the inverse where I want structure in it. Yeah. It, it's the, the, the freedom to do whatever you want is really uh, enticing and it's really powerful. Um, but after a while, I think what I've at least started to just crave more than anything else is structure, yeah. just structure around. I still want to be doing what I love, but I, I don't want necessarily like the, the kind of classic tropes that come with like being self-employed and like, right. and all that stuff. I think it's really important to have structure around um, what it is that you're doing so that you can do it successfully. Yeah. Right. If you, if you set these, these specific times and say like, Hey, every day at five, that's a hard stop for me. Yeah that gives you a deadline mm -hmm. in a sense, instead of saying, well, like I, I could just take, you know, the afternoon off, watch a movie and then I'll work from like five to nine tonight yeah. instead. It's like, yeah, you can do that. But I, I truly think that in order to, to be successful in making a job, making a living, I should say out of this hobby, giving yourself some structure is really healthy. Yeah. So back to the Chicago example, now I'm not going to be working out of my apartment anymore. And instead I'll be going to a studio every day where I have other friends working there. We're all working on stuff together and I will feel both inspired to do better work because I'm with my peers who are doing right. the same thing. And also I'm going to feel a little less uh, free to like, I'll just watch an hour of YouTube, you know, <laughs> I'm just going to like, I'll just turn on Netflix in the yeah, background, you know, definitely. like it's going to keep me accountable. And that's really important to have too. So, you know, I, I think there's, there's definitely, you know, upsides and downsides to, to working from home and like not working the traditional nine to five. But right. it's funny because after four years of, of working very atypically, if anything, I still want to keep the core of what I'm doing the same, mm -hmm. but just build a more rigorous structure around yeah. it. Nice. Yeah, yeah, I feel like too, especially after college, when you've had you know the structure of going to class every day, too. I think that post grad it can be. I mean, even if you are working a typical nine to five, just like I have all this free time. Yeah. Like no one's really telling me what to do. I think that structure can definitely be helpful, whether it's nine to five or you know mornings and evenings or mm -hmm. whatever works for each individual. Totally. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, another question for you. Uh, you recently started a podcast. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Absolutely. A little bit about, little bit about that, how that's uh, been going. Mm -hmm. um, totally. How it got started. Yeah. Whatever you want to yeah. discuss. So that, that was kind of a product of 2020 in a lot of ways. Okay. Um, this was an idea that my friend Eric and I were kicking around at the very end of 2019. Yeah. And then 2020 hit. And neither of us wanted to add more to our plates mm -hmm. because we had enough fires to put out with the amount of wedding postponements and cancellations and, and all these yeah. things that were happening. So we didn't think it was super wise to, to add like a whole nother project and thing on. But by the end of 2020 is when I was like, hey, I think it's time. Let's, let's do this. Um, and I, in a lot of ways, I have a hard time trying to like look on the bright side with yeah. how 2020 went because you know for a lot of reasons but um if if there were areas that i grew in or in that we grew in um i think one of those is having this outlet that now i think there's a lot more conviction behind the show because mm -hmm. we're able to talk about a really tough year for a lot of artists and, right. and and business owners um and we're able to draw on those experiences and have a more lived experience to actually even chat about with our guests yeah. and all of our guests have been through the exact same thing. And so we can all kind of come together after the fact and say, 
here's what I learned, here's what went great, here's what didn't, um, and hopefully we can offer advice from those conversations to our listeners in order to help them, you know, like I've kind of been saying this entire time, like turn their hobby into a career. Right. Um, and so the, the whole, the slogan for Rally Caps is it's a podcast for the creative entrepreneur building a business for the long haul. Mm-hmm. We're not trying to teach people how to hack algorithms or how to blow up on TikTok or, you know, <laughs> or whatever it is. We really want everyone to learn sound business practices yeah. from what we're talking about so that they can do what they love for a living for hopefully the rest of their life. Like that, yeah. that'd be amazing. And if you have more people doing what they love, that's a really powerful thing because I think people would be happier. Um, so, so that's kind of the, the heart behind the show. Uh, and then on a practical level, it's just it's a blast. Like Eric is one of my best friends. We just get to have conversations with some of our personal heroes every week. That's kind of what it boils down to. Uh, and that's such a privilege, honestly, like it is, it is so much fun for the two of us. Um, and we've built really great lasting friendships with a lot of these people as well, which blows my mind. Honestly, I never expected that to happen. Some of these people I've looked up to for years and suddenly we have them on the show and I'm not, I'm not like as intimidated Mm. because I've like, we've pulled back the curtain a little bit. I'm like, Oh, like you're a human too. And we're just having casual conversation about this or that thing. And, um, so it's really, it's really grounding and, um, really inspiring as well to see people that have accomplished exactly what I've like, I want to accomplish and where I Mm. want to go. Um, and also see them be just like really nice people and, and good hearted and they're humans too. Um, so yeah, the, the show itself has been, a, a wonderful investment of time. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been a lot of work for sure. Yeah. Um, but uh, that's one of the things I'm most excited about when we're going to be in Chicago is now that Eric and I will be in the same place together. Yeah. Uh, it means that we'll be able to do a lot more things that we would have previously probably just written off because it would have been too difficult um, because, you know, remote recording a podcast mm-hmm. with the two of us alone is tough. And then we add in one or two other guests every week as well. So that's just a lot of internet connections yeah. and audio <laughs> to deal with. So um, I think it'll open up a lot of doors for us. And uh, we mm. may even have our, uh, our first few sponsors on the way oh, as well, wow. which is pretty exciting. Very cool. Yeah. So, nice. yeah, pretty pumped about that. Nice. So our theme for uh, the whole festival this summer is what is the role of art in the new normal? So that could relate to photography, podcasting, um, or just art in general. What do you think? Uh, the role of art will be as we enter this new normal? Yeah, that that's a, a great question that I can offer um, <laughs> very menial insight into. <laughs> um, I, that, uh, yeah, I'm honestly, I'm very curious to see what that looks like as well. Right. I think, I mean, I think the most practical observations are things like, hey, everyone seems to have a, a bigger appreciation for visual media. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether that's photography or I think especially filmmaking and just video in general. I think, you know, you saw that obviously with with the need to not only have meetings over Zoom, but have full classes over Zoom yeah. and do these really large scale things over a webcam. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think little, little things like that that often went unnoticed beforehand right. are now suddenly like right at the forefront of what's going on. Even, I mean, this is a, a very specific and weird example, but like something like the new iMac that Apple just released, they updated the webcam on that significantly, oh, wow. which I thought was really interesting because they had not done that for their computers for years, for their desktop computers at mm-hmm. least. It hadn't changed it for years. Everyone always complained about the quality of it. And then after 2020, suddenly it's like, all right, not only is the camera going to be better, but yeah. there's going to be artificial intelligence in it to like better light the scene oh and to, to make you look better and all this stuff. I'm like, okay. So even companies are recognizing yeah. it like in consumer technology. Yeah. It's, re- it's fascinating. Yeah. Like in consumer technology, you know, we're, we're trying to just make uh, like higher quality versions of these things, uh, I guess, more easily accessible. Yeah. Um, and that's just becoming a new standard, which is, which is interesting. Um, but on top of that too, I think just more broadly speaking, mm-hmm. I think there's just a, a increased appreciation, like I said earlier for, for visual media and even kind of for like the, like how well you can communicate with that almost like I, like there's, there's like 
it's almost opening up everybody's eyes to like, oh, this is this is a better way to communicate this idea or to do this thing or here here's um here's a remote way that we could do it. Here's a virtual right. way that we could do this thing because now we have the systems built out to do such and such a thing mm -hmm. really well and maybe it's actually a better practice for our business to do yeah. it remotely, but we just didn't see it that way beforehand. Right. Um, I'm speaking very vaguely, obviously, <laughs> but like, you know, no, I, yeah, you, you can true. see that in a lot of industries and, um, yeah. you know. Even something like, um, I was talking, I forget who said this a few weeks ago, but like QR codes are yeah. like everywhere. Yes. Now, and like those existed before, but yes. now I just feel like I'm seeing That's a great one. I mean, everyone has their phone, so it's just easy enough to mm -hmm. scan, save some trees. Yes. Uh, it's right there on your phone. You can look at it after an event that you're going to. Yes. Um, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, just, yeah, stuff like that that we just weren't really thinking about before. It's like, why don't it's way easier to just like, it's so much have easier. A program be digital. And absolutely. Or a, another one uh, early on, I, it's funny. I, uh, Laura and I both, we were like, okay, if we're going to order takeout, we're only going to get pl <laughs> food from places that use like toast tab. Okay. Did you see that ever? No. Like it, it's just like a specific UI, like, I don't know, like it's like a, a service that the business pays for, but it's like the cleanest way to have an online menu oh. and it makes the ordering process really simple. Yeah. And I saw a lot of businesses that hadn't had that before adopt that because they also realized like, Oh, this is just easier for the customer right. to use. And then every place, now from from what i've seen are the places that we go to most often they all use it too mm. and i think that might actually be good for the long haul for them because it's not like ordering out is going to go away right. it's going to probably reduce as dining in increases but on the whole it's like that's not a bad system to yeah. have you know <laughs> if it makes it easier and it incentivizes people to mm. order that's great so that's that's much more techy than it is maybe artistic, but you know, there's yeah. a lot of examples like no, that. Yeah, definitely just a lot of little things too that sort of deal with art and mm -hmm. performance and video and just, yeah, just so many, so many things. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> I think that, but the, the iMac camera thing was, was fascinating. Yeah, no, that's I was wild. like, oh wow, okay. Oh All right, y'all are very aware of this and yeah. Yeah, I'll be interested to see how, how that gets uh, like more widely adopted. Yeah. So, yeah. Very yeah. interesting. All right, well, uh, back to photography yeah. for a second. I'm wondering, because um, I feel like what's great about photography is that really everyone can, and anyone can kind of do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone has a phone. We have cameras on our phones mm -hmm. now. Um, I'm wondering if you have any basic sort of do's and don'ts for Ooh, photographers, whether it's on okay. like the professional level or just like if you're shooting something on your iPhone, just some okay. basic okay. do's and don'ts for um Ooh photographers. That's really fun. Okay. So one of my favorite things to teach people for iPhone photography, Yeah. Um, I'm sure it works on Android as well. I just, I use an iPhone and so I, I'm familiar with that interface, but um, I probably can't hold the mic and show you at the same time. <laughs> but when you open up your camera app on your, your iPhone specifically, yeah. you're looking at a, a certain scene in front of you. And I think what a lot of people don't know is that if if you don't like the way it looks, you can adjust the exposure, which is the brightness of the image, by mm -hmm. tapping on the screen once, which people do to focus. But yeah. then if you tap, and while that yellow box is still there, you drag your finger down uh -huh. on the right side of that box, you'll darken the image. Yeah. And if you raise your finger, it'll brighten the image, yes. which I think just in general opens up a lot of like creative options like if yeah. you want a photo that's just like a little darker or a little moodier like you can focus on this really bright thing bring the exposure down a little bit and now it has like a really cool kind of edge to yeah. it um so that's a fun one I, I, every time i do that on my phone and i'm doing it we yeah, next to a friend or something like yeah. wait what did you just do like why does it <laughs> why does yours look like that and mine looks like yeah. this kind of thing um so i think it offers just like a lot of creative flexibility for people that want to you know, like use your use your smartphone yeah. a little bit more um, for photography. Yeah. As far as professional stuff is concerned, or like like bigger cameras, things along those lines, right. I would say this is. I mean, there are no hard and fast rules, but <laughs> m my preference is when it comes to photography. Um, there's a, a difference in lenses in like the way that they are designed and built. So there are two at, at the core there's like two different kinds there's mm -hmm. prime lenses and there's zoom lenses okay. and zoom lenses are kind of self-explanatory you know you can twist the ring on the lens and you can bring like whatever is far away a little closer to you and then you can twist it back out and it's it's wider and you can cover a lot of 
focal lengths, yeah. which is really cool. I don't own any zoom lenses because for me, the benefit of prime lenses are because they're not zooming in and out. Mm -hmm. This is going to get a little technical, but because they, they don't have all the, the, like, the zooming in and out, all the components inside of them, they're actually built to let more light into them, just okay. broadly speaking. Um, and because of that, they offer a little more uh, like low light, dark situation versatility. Like mm -hmm. they make more potential pictures possible. That was a lot of alliteration. <laughs> I didn't mean for that to be a thing. Um, but they, they re it really like it opens up your creative possibilities because if you can see more light, I mean, that's, that's what an image is. It's mm -hmm. just light. So at a wedding, for example, having that low light capability is really helpful because a lot of a wedding day is pretty dark and dim. So it just opens up a lot of really cool opportunities. The other thing, the, the part that I enjoy the most about them is the fact that they force you to interact with what you're actually taking a photo of. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is if you can't just zoom in and out, that means you need to move your body to get yeah. close to your subject. You can't yeah. just stand in one spot and like, <laughs> all right, okay, there we go, wide, okay, nice and tight, okay, and a medium, and then you're just, you're just done. You actually have to get involved. You have to get yeah. skin in the game. And when you do that, I think it makes you a better storyteller because, again, I'll just use weddings as an example. All right. If you're getting into the action, I mean, even, even just like literally being in closer proximity with someone could open up the door for a conversation mm -hmm. that you maybe didn't have because you were standing, you know, 20 feet back with a long lens and you're just kind of like on the outskirts of things. Um, and so using prime lenses force you typically to just just be more involved yeah. with your subjects. Um, and I think that's a really important skill to have as a photographer instead of, I mean, I'm not trying to completely knock on zoom lenses. Like they, <laughs> they have their place for sure, like for travel and um, landscapes and sports and all of these things. Absolutely. Um, but for my personal preference for, you know, weddings and portraits and the, the types of subjects that I photograph, mm -hmm. I find it's really, really beneficial to just move myself rather than move the lens in yeah. order to compose an image. Nice. Yeah. Potential photos possible. <laughs> <laughs> Again. <laughs> With all the P, I mean, the P is the worst one to have for this, <laughs> no, too. It's not a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. All the plosives. <laughs> um, I'm wondering, because I feel like I could never um, photograph a wedding. I mean, one, okay. I'm not a photographer, so I <laughs> wouldn't know how. But if I was, I also feel like I would just be very nervous. I feel like it's a lot okay. of pressure to be like yeah. photographing a wedding, that these photos will be in someone's home for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. um, so do you find, do you get nervous or are you just like so used to doing it now and you just know that there's like so many opportunities to get shots throughout the day? Like what do you, how, how is that? I absolutely get nervous. Okay. Yeah, 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 a hundred percent. I remember being terrified for the very first wedding I ever shot yeah. and the fear has definitely gone down okay. since then, but I always get a little pre-wedding jitters for yeah. sure. I think that's true for almost any wedding photographer you talk to. How do you find you manage just sort of all it, that? It's tough, honestly. Yeah. Like, I, I, think, I think, honestly, the, the hardest part of the day for me is like the hour before I even start because yeah. that's when I can be in my head. Right. But once I actually start taking photos, I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I've, I've got this. I know what I'm doing. This couple is awesome. We're having a fun time. Yeah. You know, I, I looked over the timeline before. Everything looks comfortable. Everything's going to go well. Mm. And uh, I think, especially in this, this past, well, I won't say entire year, but like in my 2021 season so far, I have been significantly less anxious before weddings. Yeah. And uh, truth be told, I think part of that even actually goes back to rally caps a little bit because for the past six months, as I mentioned earlier, I've, I've gotten to interview a personal hero basically every week, yeah. right? And I think something about that has helped me be a little more confident in myself mm -hmm. because I've, I've been doing things that I previously didn't think were possible or that I wasn't capable of. And so that's helped me, I think, just kind of lead with a more confident foot yeah. on wedding days also, um, which is funny how those, those two kind of interact with each other. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it's really funny. I think that's true for a lot of other wedding photographers too, is that Th this is the toughest battle right here. Yeah. It's all in your head because once you actually start taking photos, 
that's that's the easy part, right? Mm-hmm. The tough the tough thing is um, allowing yourself to be like, oh, but what if this goes wrong? <laughs> or like, oh, I have to drive this far to get to the wedding, or yeah. like I'll need to find parking before, and then this and that, and you know, oh, what if they don't like me? And what if I make a mistake or miss <laughs> the kiss or whatever it is? You know, those thoughts can run wild, but I think it's just a matter of suppressing that a little bit. Yeah. Just getting to the start of the day Definitely. and then then rolling with it. Have you ever had like a wedding disaster? Like you forgot a lens or something or just something mm. went like horribly wrong? Like anything? No, like uh, honestly, no. And I feel like an outlier because of that, because <laughs> almost every one of my industry friends have some kind of like horror story kind of thing it's like a joke to like look back and be like oh like what's your worst wedding experience (laughs) kind of thing like everyone seems to have one and for the life of me I cannot think of a wedding that went so horribly wrong that it was just Mm -hmm. terrible like I've had very long wedding days that have just been tiring but that's you know I was expecting that going in or I've had you know weddings where the time like they're an hour and a half behind kind of thing but even that is like oh well you know, to a certain degree, there, there's some flexibility here and there and the venue is like OK with it. So, you know, it's technically an issue, but no one's really acting like it is kind of yeah. thing. So like everybody's just rolling with it. Um, it's not like it was on me or it was a mistake that I made that caused all these things to happen. So, um, yeah, no, I, you know, haven't had like a bride pass out during the ceremony right. or anything like that. Um, it's all been for better or worse, pretty straightforward. Awesome. Yeah. So I said for better or worse, that feels like a wedding <laughs> cliche. I didn't mean to do that either, but it's fine. <laughs> this was sent in by, I think a student, or I guess they might not be a student, but uh, what is the best way to pitch yourself and not get ghosted after quoting a job? Hmm. So I assume that's talking about wedding photography or I guess portraits or yeah, any totally kind of photo job. Totally. So, yeah, so this this can, you know, we're, we're speaking a lot in weddings and porches, like you said, but mm-hmm. I think this can apply to really any kind of just paid gig that you're getting as a yeah. freelancer where you kind of have to win the bid, so to speak. Right. Um, what I do to, I, I mean, I obviously you can't guarantee anything, but what I do to increase my chances of booking a wedding, uh, I, I think a lot of it comes down to being prompt to respond to the initial email to begin with and then also in your first response to them propose the idea of of a phone call Mm -hmm. like get it off of email as quickly as you can because email is very impersonal and it's a lot easier for people to kind of disassociate you from being a human being after a while because it's just like oh it's we haven't even heard this person's voice i haven't seen them talk to me kind of thing um and so i think what I've found a lot of success in at least is just immediately pitching the idea of, all right, let's get on the phone. I'd Mm -hmm. love to hear about your wedding. I'd love to hear from the two of you about what your photography needs are and really make it sound like this is going to be a relationship right off the bat, not just, you know, a vendor that's there to just pick up a paycheck and leave. Um, I really try to convey that immediately. And then once I get them on the phone, it's, I mean, it's just so much more, conversational and fun Mm -hmm. and it flows better than emails do you know and there's there's never any risk of that like oh you know sorry I missed your email and it's two weeks later kind of thing and at that point they've maybe found someone else so I think it's it's a lot harder for people to say no or at least it's harder for people to completely ghost you yeah once they've actually talked to you right um at least again in my experience Mm -hmm. so I would highly recommend that if you're trying to land a job whether that's a wedding or whatever it is like immediately respond or as quickly as you can and then try to get them on the phone so you can just talk with them and, and kind of win them over with yeah. your personality. No, that's great. Yeah. I have a question. Mm-hmm. Um, that might be dumbest question in the world, <laughs> but I'm really curious. Yeah. Um, so when you are a wedding photographer like yourself, mm-hmm. who photographs your wedding? Oh, <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> I love that so one. Who, who does it? Yep. How does that process come about then also what's Mm -hmm. it like Mm -hmm. having the day the day of you're not the one behind the camera like are you just like yeah do whatever or are you like I definitely want this shot because like (laughs) I know I usually get this shot when I'm doing the weddings what it 
What is that like? Because you got That's married so two years ago? Uh, yeah, almost exactly two years ago. It was uh, September 28th, 2019. So and we were up uh, about 20 minutes north of Portland, okay. Maine. Nice. Um, yeah, it was, it was awesome. I mean, it was, in our eyes, truly like the perfect wedding day. Yeah. I mean, it, it was so much fun. And um, a big part of that was because we had our friend Eric come and photograph it. And that's okay. the same Eric that uh, hosts yeah, yeah. Rally Caps. Yeah. Uh, we, we host that together. Awesome. Um, so yeah, Eric came and photographed it. And one of the, <laughs> one of the funny things about having a lot of friends in the wedding photography industry is that mm -hmm. you can pretty much guarantee the only friend that can come is the one that shoots your wedding because everybody else is booked kind of thing. You're like, Oh, like I'd invite you, but I already know that all of you are booked because it's a prime time in September right. kind of thing. So my only friend in like the photo world that was able to come was Eric because we paid him to be there. Um, <laughs> so we had him come and shoot it. Um, and I mean, we invited his whole family to come because mm -hmm. we're just friends. So it was fun right. to have them as guests and he was there and it was very low pressure for him because we, again, we're just, that close and it just it, it worked out yeah. very well um so yeah i mean he's he was just the exact style that we wanted he was the exact personality that we wanted uh and we knew he would get amazing photos that would really preserve the the feeling awesome. of the day so yeah because it was him i did not have any like itch inside of me of like yeah i have to pick up the camera now like I have to, <laughs> I have to, can i just look over your shoulder real quick and make sure you're getting you know <laughs> it, it, make sure it's good enough whatever it is i was like no i completely trust you you're going to do an amazing job and he did it was, yeah. it was phenomenal uh so yeah i'd say yeah nice. for anyone else looking for a photographer it it doesn't hurt to start with friends yeah. just to see because it, it makes all the difference in the world for someone that you trust or at least know even loosely to right. come in versus hiring a total stranger mm -hmm. um Obviously, that needs to happen sometimes, yeah. but <laughs> even the way that I like to mitigate that is by, for the most part, always including an engagement shoot in the wedding packages that I offer because yeah. I think it is so beneficial to just spend an hour together even. Take a couple photos, absolutely, mm -hmm. but more importantly, get to know one another beforehand right. because if... I walk in on the wedding day and I've already taken your engagement photos. It's like, oh my gosh, like the, their friends recognize me. It's like, oh, you're the guy that took their photos that were on the website. That's super cool. And yeah. to the couple, it's like, oh, Steven's here and not, oh, are you Steven? Right. Kind of thing, right? Like we know each other. Yeah. We've established that personal. trust. Yeah, it's it's so much more personal. So um, yeah, I'd say try to hire your friends if you can. <laughs> but if not, just try to get to know your photographer and make yeah. sure that trust is there. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank, thank you for answering that. Yeah, of course. Oh, no, I love that. It's, it's super fun to talk about. And I, I haven't actually like talked about our wedding photos that much. And yeah. um, it was a really fun process to be on the other side of the camera. Yeah. yeah. Are there any shots at weddings that you like to get that you feel like are pretty unique or that you had done that were like oh, uh, a unique sort of angle or a moment in the day that usually isn't yeah. captured hmm. that much? Yeah. So... I'd say um, artistically, some of the things that I do, uh, like techniques such as like using a prism or doing uh, like an in-camera double exposure or using a tilt shift lens or kind of using some interesting pieces of equipment to begin with to just get a, a more uncommon look yeah. um, for like a few photos in the gallery. It's not like that's going to be everything, mm -hmm. but I think for me, I try to get like five to 10 like hero shots, so to speak per gallery as like the ones to wow them right. to really make them feel like, Oh my gosh, like I look like a superhero or like I should be on a movie poster or something like that. You know, yeah. it's fun to really make couples feel like, like they look fantastic cause they do. And to make them feel like really special with those. Um, and then as far as moments are concerned, I don't try to, plan out as many so much as I just like to be very aware and in tune with the day because mm -hmm. um, my my style for the most part is very photojournalistic very reactive to what's going on um, so I think by that inherently I've seen a lot of things that often go unnoticed because I'm very deliberately like just aware and I kind of have my head on a swivel I'm just I'm ready for something to happen whether it's like hey like your your niece went out onto the dance floor and like it was like break dancing or like <laughs> something like that. It's like, oh my gosh, that was so funny and so yeah. cool. And like just being aware of those things and, and trying to listen and look and, and just make sure you're, you're a fabric 
a part of the fabric of the day, I think, yeah. will reflect itself in the photos that you deliver. Very cool. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, too, we've talked a lot about sort of day of, like the wedding itself. What are maybe some other uh, things on the business uh, and maybe like before the wedding or after the wedding that you think people might not know about that they should know about if they're looking to get into wedding photography or event photography? Yeah, that is a great question. So as far as as business practices that you might be unaware of, or even just like parts of the post-production or pre-production process as well. Um, Oh man, there's a lot for sure. (laughs) Um, I think some of the, some of the best practices that I have kind of gathered over the years, I think is uh, managing finance as well. Mm. Um, And by that, I mean both keeping track of it and just having a way that you're documenting all of it yeah. so that you know exactly where your money is going in and out. Um, and then being relatively frugal, especially if you started the way that I did, which was just kind of like jump in the deep end, just mm-hmm. commit to it right from the outset, but simultaneously not being afraid to invest in yourself. Because I do think to a certain degree, you, I mean, there are certain necessities that every business is going to have up front. Right. And if you're scared to buy those things, you're going to limit yourself and limit what you're capable of doing. Uh, so I think, you know, being, being just wise, generally speaking, which is such a lame piece of advice to give, but like be wise with your money kind of thing. Um, I, I'd say like more than anything, just don't be afraid to invest in yourself because yeah. it does take money in order to make more money uh, and finding uh, ways to either, you know, buy a certain service or maybe outsource your editing or, or paying money to get more time back for yourself will help you become a better business owner because that's the one thing that we can't buy, right? You yeah. can't buy time. So finding ways to stop trading your your time for money and instead find ways to like outsource some parts of your business, I think is hugely valuable. Uh, and then even like more practically speaking for me, I think one of the, the, I think like best investments I've made, I was actually talking about this earlier with a friend, but one of the best investments that I've made, um, again, this is very specific to weddings, but just, uh, buying a service, um, that presents like photo galleries for delivery Uh, to couples because you know they've spent a lot of money on the photos i've spent a lot of time and energy and i'm really proud of these photos if i were to put their whole wedding day into like a google drive folder Mm. that doesn't feel as special as uploading it to the service that is literally built to like display everything beautifully and allow them to buy prints of the photos and it, it makes it feel like a more special moment for them when they're you know eagerly waiting to get their wedding mm-hmm. photos, um, which kind of comes back to, I think, just like an underlying principle in my business of just trying to exceed client expectations and treating them really well. Yeah. Um, and I think by you know investing in those little things, uh, it makes a really, really huge difference in the way that uh, your services are perceived. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, also sort of on the business end of things, how important would you say that branding has been um, mm-hmm. in your in your work and as you've grown. Um, mm-hmm. I've seen your website just look super professional. You have a great <laughs> logo, oh, um, thanks, man. great photos on there just sort of showing sort of what you can do. So how important would you say that that is? Yeah. Um, I mean, when you're starting out, it might be sp- smaller, but as you grow, just sort of getting out there what your brand is. Totally. I, I personally think it's very important because it's... <sighs> It's one of those things that like I think I think probably a lot of artists can relate to this of like I wanted to build a business and I want really wanted like a good logo for it and so I tried to like in Microsoft Paint like make myself a logo <laughs> kind of thing. Like, I feel like a lot of people have been in that position where they're like, "Oh, I'll just like make my own logo." Yeah. And um you can never do it as well as a professional can, yeah. right? Like for me to think that I can make my own logo is the same thing of like a couple thinking they can take their own wedding photos, right? right? Like it's a service you need to hire out to someone else who is a professional yeah. in the industry. And kind of back to the last point we were just talking about, it makes so much more sense to pay someone else to do that and get something that you're going to love instead of spending a lot of your own time making something that's going to be mediocre and not even represent your business very well. So it is, I mean, it can be 
you know, like, you get a little sticker shock looking at it. And you're like, I don't really know if I want to spend like that much money on like a logo. Right. Mm-hmm. But that logo is going to be a part of your business and it can be on your website and your business cards and your, your social accounts and all this stuff. So if it's going to be seen by a lot of people, you want to be proud of it. And not only are you going to get more of your own time back by not trying to hack it together, yeah. but you'll also get something that you're really proud of. So mm-hmm. for me, at least hugely valuable, I would recommend everyone just hire a designer to actually get a proper logo and like a whole suite of, you know, you can even get like a whole brand guidelines kit and like colors and fonts and all these things so that you don't have to spend the time picking all those things. Definitely. And I mean, I feel like so much of it too, like you'll have for like years. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I I really wanted it to be as timeless as possible because I'm like, I kind of only want to do this once. You could update it in like five years. Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, keep it timeless enough. Yeah. I'm not going to change my name anytime soon. (laughs) So I think that I think it kind of works out. But yeah. Yeah. No, I I think it's a really good investment for for truly any artist, unless you are a designer, in which case I think you can do your own logo. Uh, But, you know, anyone else, I think it's definitely worthwhile to to hire that out. Well, I think we're just uh, about at time here. So one final question for you is just what advice would you give yourself, say, five years ago as you were just sort of starting out on your professional yeah. journey? Um, just things that you wish you'd done or done differently. Um, yeah, just advice. Great. I love it. Um, I think we we talked about this briefly earlier, but I think broadly speaking, it is a very wise decision to have a salaried job, mm-hmm. a very consistent nine to five as you are building up some kind of side business or some kind of uh, hobby side hustle type, type thing. Um, so I think that's that's my recommendation for anyone that is looking to do either what I've done or uh, more specifically, like take their specific hobby and turn that into a business. I think it, it is a, a lot more comfortable um, if you have some source of income that you can rely on while you do that, for sure. Um, if you do feel inclined to take my approach, uh, I would love to talk with you about that and go like even more in depth about some of the the benefits and the the struggles that come with it. Um, and I truly mean that too. Like we can chat about that anytime. I mean, it's a very near and dear subject to my heart. Um, but beyond that, I, I would say even in those those college years leading up to my inevitable and I guess accidental turn into being a photographer I think the the thing for me that really sealed the deal on photography I guess it was kind of in in two parts one was just doing it consistently Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's true for really anything in life I think with building good habits and with just becoming better at the things that you love consistency is key yeah. Um, and I think just having a rhythm, um, whether or not you're, you're doing it for money at that point is, is irrelevant. I think just going out and taking your camera and saying every day at 5 p.m., I'm just going to go out after my classes are over. I'm going to go walk around campus or go to a, a new town that I haven't seen before and just go take photos for 30 minutes. And that's mm-hmm. it. Just developing little, little practices and little things that will just get you doing that thing more often you're going to ideally love it more and also get better at it over time. Uh, so I think that that is a, a huge part of it. And then I'd also say actively seek out mentors yeah. to give you advice uh, and to hope maybe like do some internship type work for or uh, just to assist for certain things. Um, because that experience, that lived hands-on experience is going to be invaluable. If you really are dead set on on making it a job, being able to watch them do it firsthand. Yeah. It, it, and it's, you literally can't put a price on that because even just one day of watching like Mark or Bill who I've talked about already, mm-hmm. watching them do what they do. I learned so, so much from, I mean, I, I have to spend countless hours with both of them and it was yeah. huge for me. Um, so I think, you know, seeking out mentors and, and not being afraid to reach out to people and say like, Hey, I'm so-and-so I'm a student at, Gordon College and I want to be a photographer. Can I assist you? Can I provide a service for you so that I can learn how it is that you do business? Um, You know, that's a great trade off because for them, it could be either free or cheaper work and it's like a helping hand. Um, And for you, you get the benefit of watching someone who's very established uh, and you get to 
just learn a ton just by observing them and by working with them hands on. Yeah. Um, so I think that consistency and those those mentors were a, a huge, huge um, played a huge role in, in my uh, development as a photographer um, up until that point where I was like, all right, time to jump in. Like, let's do it myself. Um, yeah. And here we are now, four years later, and suddenly it's photography and it's filmmaking and it's podcasting and it's all of these things. Yeah. And, you know, all of those other branches of creativity have, have stemmed from the fact that I've been able to be a photographer. Mm. And just by doing that, I've met so many people along the way. I've met lifelong friends. I've met industry friends. And I've made these connections that have opened up more doors than I ever expected in my life. What I'm doing now is not what I expected to be doing four years ago. And I couldn't be happier about that. Yeah. So I'd say it's it's absolutely worth the risk. Um, and, you know, try to make it as as least risky as possible if you can. <laughs> yeah. um, but if not, I, I think there's a lot of uh, reward to be had um, if you're just willing to kind of put yourself out there and see what happens. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for stopping by yeah. today and doing this interview for Absolutely. however long we've been going, an hour. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, this has been great. Um, where can people connect with you if they want to maybe reach out and learn some more, keep the conversation going, yeah. um, or hire you for their wedding or yeah, yeah, yeah. something? Um, feel free to plug anything you want. Totally. Um, yeah, if you want to just talk more about anything it is that we talked about today, um, you can find me on Instagram at Stephen M. Schultz. You can check out my website, which is stephenschultzphotography.com. Uh, you can also hear me do this uh, on a weekly basis, uh, Rally Cops podcast, which you can find on you know Spotify and Apple Podcasts and all that stuff. Um, if you are looking for a resource for helping build your business, and if you want to hear from some really incredible industry titans in the photo and video world, uh, you can learn from them there as well. But please reach out. Uh, if you'd like to hire me, that'd be great. Uh, but you know, just at a baseline, would love to chat with any and all of you um, just on a personal level and hopefully give some of that advice that I was talking about earlier. So yeah, thanks awesome. for watching. Thank you so much. <laughs> any uh, merch? Oh, <laughs> any merch. Oh, baby. Oh, man. Uh, not yet. But uh, if you do follow Rally Caps at all, uh, we might have some literal Rally Caps coming out by the end of this oh, year. Cool. So uh, stay tuned for that. <laughs> Very cool. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you again so yeah. much for stopping by. Um, thank you, everyone, who tuned in to watch this video. Um, this is going to be week four of our Fine Arts Festival. We'll have one more session next week. It's going to be a communication arts panel with a few alums, so definitely tune in for that. And all of our previous sessions, um, which have been recorded, they'll be on our YouTube channel, and there's links to all those at gordon.edu slash fineartsfest. So thank you again for tuning in, and we'll see you real soon. <laughs> <laughs>